place a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real. It is living. It is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives His love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Welcome to your church. If you're willing and able, why don't you just have a seat? <laughs> We're doing this for a reason, but if you want to stand, be my guest, and let's praise the Lord. Here we go.
Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, this coming Sunday, the Angel Tree gifts, if you're one of the ones providing Angel Tree gifts, need to be here by tomorrow, or hopefully by Monday, uh, so we can get them all organized and ready. We're going to be doing the Angel Tree gift giveaway on Saturday afternoon, the 18th. If weather permitting, we'll be out in the courtyard. Angel Tree, for those of you that don't know, is a, a ministry that we do where we buy gifts through prison ministry for children whose parents are incarcerated. And so obviously their parents wouldn't be able to buy them a gift, and so we buy one and it's given to them in the, in the parents' name. Um, and so we have the gift giveaway. Now Santa Claus is going to be here, so if you got kids, grandkids, or somebody, if, if you want to come sit in Santa's lap, he'll be here, and uh, he'd be happy to have you do that. He's, he's a jolly old fellow about that. And uh, there'll be opportunities for photos and that kind of stuff. We're going to light the third candle on the Advent wreath. This is the third week of Advent. And so uh, I'm going to read this little thing and when, when it gets done we're going to sing it should be yeah it's all on the screen uh, we're going to just sing the chorus from O Come O Come Emmanuel and uh, we'll do our best to have a good note when we start it if we don't we'll correct it as we go we like this candle as a symbol of Christ our joy may the joyful promise of your presence O God make us rejoice in our hope of salvation together if you can O oh, come, 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 great Lord of all, who to thy tribes on Sinai's high, in ancient times once gave the law, in cloud and majesty he and all. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be here for worship. We today especially lift up prayers for Brent Chapman and his family as they're grieving the loss of his mother. We're grateful that we had a church that was willing to support and take care of the family. And we pray for them to have peace, that peace that you give that's not like the world gives. We lift up prayers right now for all who are struggling during this holiday season. And hopefully, hopefully we can be examples of how we represent it as a season of faith and holiness and a search for Jesus more than a search for which the best guy to get gift to buy. God, we thank you for your presence with us tonight. We thank you for the way that you lead us and guide us. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Uh, tonight we're going to journey into the James's letter, and uh, it's in the fifth chapter. We've been again with verse seven. It doesn't look like mine. Is it the same oh, it's in the message. Oh, well, it's okay. I'll read it in the message. Let me just get. I didn't. That, that's, that's not a good one, though. That's a good one anyway. Yeah, I'll just read it in the message. Well, well, right. For those of you that don't know, the message is a paraphrase. It was done by Eugene Peterson, who was a Presbyterian preacher. Uh, it's considered really good, and sometimes it's useful for us to hear it in plain old language, which is what he does for us. Uh, Well, I guess it would help if I knew where it was. Okay. James chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. It still doesn't look like that. That's right. Oh, yeah, it might look like that. I'm not in the right place. It's not my morning, is it? It still doesn't look like that. James, so that, that's because it's not James. Got a problem like that? I could just read it off the screen, but I like to use the book. You, you can have them all again. Yeah, those are the right words. <laughs> I don't know why I'm having so much trouble, but I'm having it. I have James. Just a minute ago. Here we go. Look. James, chapter 5. Oh, now it looks right. Here we go. <laughs> Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see, farmers do this all the time. Waiting for valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow, mature work. Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. The master could arrive at any time. Friends, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing just around the corner. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit, all the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. Oh, y'all, you're through already. Well, I'm going to finish this. You've heard, of course, Job's staying power. And you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. That's because God cares. He cares right down to the last detail. Oh, we finally got there. I entitled this message Expectations because I think sometimes... When we think about God, our expectations are somewhere different than what God's going to provide. Uh, I, I recently ran into a guy when we had the pumpkin patch going on, and he said, look, he said, my life is a mess. I'm living in a car. I don't have any money. My wife's left me. I pray every day. Why had God fixed it? I mean, his expectations are somehow that if you just pray, it'll be fixed. But you know, and, and I put this on Facebook the other day too, it's very true. Sometimes you ask God for to, what to do and He gives you a shovel because <laughs> you've got to go do some stuff. And so if we're going to do what God has called us to do to transform the world, we have to be some kind of an example to other people by doing something besides just whatever it is we think God wants us to do. You know, I struggle with that all the time. What is God's plan for me, for us for the church for what what are we supposed to do for God and and there's a lot of things that we do and some of them bear a lot of fruit and so I'm believing that when we bear fruit God's on board but sometimes because we're people we get ego into it and then we say well we're going to do this because it's going to help the church well the church doesn't need help God needs help and when we start to think about those things is is like surviving years ago uh, Bishop Huey 
sent a message out to all of us preachers and said, you need to preach a sermon on why the world needs the United Methodist Church. Now, I wouldn't do it. I, I was disobedient. Because the world doesn't need the United Methodist Church. The world needs the Christians that are birthed from the United Methodist Church. And, and so there's a difference between those two things. Now, have we done good things in the Texas Annual Conference? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Methodist Hospital was birthed out of our conference. We've done some wonderful things. But we give birth to them, and then they live as their own entity doing what they do. And, and you know, Methodist Hospital gives away millions and millions and millions of dollars of free care every year. Now, when, when you're like me and you go there and you get a hospital bill, it's hard to see that. But trust me, they're giving away lots and lots of free care. But I wonder sometimes if, if our expectation of God isn't that, that God is, is taking maybe a more active role in the world. And it seems to me that if, if you read carefully what, especially in the Gospel of John, what Jesus says to the disciples, and I believe to us, is that I'm leaving this to you. you got some work to do. And I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to help you. But you got some work to do. It's on Peter that we build the church. It's on the people of God that we change the world. It's not, we're not going to, you know, somebody asked me the other day, and, and, and I always am, am mystified by these questions. They said, so, so you collect offerings at the church. Yeah, we do. Because that's, we, yeah, I mean, we, we have a commitment to God. Each one of us has our own. Whatever God says you're supposed to give, it's what you give, right? And he said, so then you mail that into the Methodist church. No. And then they may obey you back enough to pay payroll and all that other stuff. I said, I don't even know where you would get an idea like that. You know, there is no big bank up over on our main office on Main Street where they just dole out money. Any money they have is money we give them. And so in a way, you know, the responsibility we have is if we want to be the church here, then we got to make sure we have a church here to be. And, and I, I have a note. I, I'm going to try it. To read it to you. It's very small print. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we have a, a we have on the back porch back there a blessing box, and it's a it's a free will offering. People give whatever they can, and they uh, that's just all the requirement. They just give whatever they can, and if they want to take some, they take it, and if they have some extra, they leave it. Uh, okay, now I got it. So this note was left last week. Thank you all for the blessing box. It's such a great and wonderful idea. I wish more folks saw it that way. Allowing people to grab what they need without a thousand questions. But most importantly, allows people to retrieve food when they're able to get here. As opposed to jumping through the hoops only to make it to a food pantry right as they're closing and be told to, you're too late. Anyhow, I just want you to know and thank the people of this church and the church for such a huge blessing. Day after day. The impact you all have made on our community is really huge. People speak highly of this church and this blessing box. This community is struggling right now. But trust me, they're great. Oh, and thanks for not passing judgment. And keep doing what you're doing. Her name was Jennifer. She said, thanks. It was written pretty sloppy, so she apologized for that. And then she said, if you don't know, there's a large part of our community that's homeless and on the streets these days. I just wanted you to know that. Now, okay, so why are we here? To me, that's why we're here. Have we made a difference to somebody? Do we know them? And do we get to see them? Do they show up in church? Do they contribute to the church? No, but God knows. And, and I think for me, when I, when I read through this particular scripture, you know, it rings true for me. It says, meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You know, like the farmers do. I don't know how many of you have ever worked around, been around farms, but um, for about nine years or several years, I, I sold farm equipment. And my experience of that was the, to watch the miraculous thing that rice farmers did. Every year they would go out, you've seen the rice fields are full of water. They'd go out there and they'd level them and they called it water leveling and they'd have levees so they'd have certain spots that were flat enough to hold the water level. And they would do that for months and months. They'd get it just right. 
They drain the field and plant the rice. Normally, or frequently, they planted it by airplane. And there was always an argument every year between the rice farmers, do we plant before Easter or after Easter? Because the challenge is, if they plant before Easter, you know what happens a lot of times right before Easter, right? We get a little freeze. If they plant right before Easter and they don't have time to flood the field before the freeze comes, then their whole crop is lost. And so it's a gamble. They, they, they figure it out based on experience. Some, something that, you know, experience, strength, and hope really is what they use. And, and the ones that do it right and have been doing it a long time are able to harvest earlier in the spring, in the fall, which is important because what happens in this part of the country in the fall, we get hurricanes. Now those rice farmers, when I was doing it, and I'm talking about a long time ago now, it's been years, it would cost $500 an acre to plant rice. And some of them had three, four, five hundred, six hundred acres. Can you imagine putting that kind of money up there, not knowing what was going to come out on the other end? Well, you see, God gives us an answer for that. Is you wait patiently. You do everything that you know to do. You put the fertilizer right, you put the zip out, you do everything you can. And then you know what? God will do some more. Those plants will come up and they grow. And like everything else, sometimes they have weeds. And then they have to deal with that. It's called red rice. So I learned a lot about faith. And I learned a lot about greed. Because during the time I was doing that, we also had some farmers that in off years would grow soybeans. I stopped by this one farmer's house one day and I said, hey, how you doing? He said, I'm fine, I'm really good. He said, man, soybeans are up today. He said, if I go sell them today, I'm going to make a good profit. And I thought, well, that's great. I'm so happy for you. Because then I'm thinking maybe I can sell him something. So I go back in a week or so and I say, hey man, how'd you do? And he said, oh, company came and I forgot to sell them. And he said, they're way, way down now. I lost all that money. And I said, I don't think you lost anything if you hadn't sold them yet, number one. But number two, what part of this is God's fault? You knew what to do and when to do it. And so I think all the time, those of us that have been to AA, you know, we hear all these excuses why people drink. I've heard a number of them, probably not everyone. Uh, you know, the real honest ones say, just because I like to. <laughs> you know? but, but if you want to change a behavior, then you got to look at what precipitates that behavior. I heard it said today, Jesus is of the world. in the world but not of the world we're supposed to live in the world but if we get too much of the world in us we forget about Jesus's message we need a lot of Jesus in us to go out into the world you know there's a lot of ministry to be done by us recovering alcoholics we probably could we could do a lot of good ministry if we went to a lot of bars but that's a risky deal you know I, you really can, you got to be careful because the world will get into you and I see personally see sin is exactly the same way. If you want to if you want to live without sin, then start to hang out with people that are trying to live without sin. Because if you just go hang out with the people that don't care, pretty soon you're going to not care. If you go work construction, I promise you, you your four letter words will be more prevalent in your vocabulary. It'll happen because it happens there. If you go hang out with people that don't have any morals, pretty soon uh, you don't have any question about what you're doing either. And so I think when, when we hear this, you know, this, this whole message right here, of be careful, be careful. Don't complain about each other. I mean, really, you ever heard that deal about what you don't like about somebody, you probably got some of it yourself? You know, my third grade school teacher used to say, when you point your finger, you got three pointing back at yourself. I think that's kind of what, what James is saying here is be careful about judging and complaining others because guess what? Somebody's going to judge you too. And I, and I think right now in our world, we're really living through that. I know the United Methodist Church is living through that. And since the newspaper came out and all the articles have been out in the last week, I've had a number of phone calls. People have asked me about it. And what I can tell you is that for the most part, most of what you heard isn't true. Most of it's just not true. Um, we're and our rules, our rules, which are done in the discipline, which are done at the general conference, only can be changed at a general conference, and there has not been one, and there will not be one until 2024. So, 
you know, there's, a, there's an argument. Well, some people in the western part of the United States violated the rules. Yeah, they did. We can't do anything about it. They're in the western part of the United States. Any more than you can do anything about somebody that's speeding up here in Fairmont right now. Yeah, you can't do anything about it. And what they're suggesting is that because somebody's speeding on Fairmont, we should all get a ticket. And that just makes no sense at all. So it, it, there's a lot of issues, and some of it's around money, some of it's around control. Uh, it, isn't it always about money and control? Yes. Amen. And, and so what I know is that in my calling and my work and my rules that I go by, nothing's changed. We still have a lot of work to do. We need to reach out and make disciples. We need to share love with other people. We need to invite our friends again and again and again into relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes that'll actually happen in our church. But whether it happens in another church, that's okay. We don't need to judge the other churches because they have a different rule structure than we do. We just need to be glad they're on the same team. That's right. And we need to reach out to people because there's enough of us, there are enough of us in the world to change it. But we're, we're lazy. I mean, I, I don't, if, if I was coaching a football team, I mean, I'd have to say, you guys are not playing. And I don't mean you particularly, but the, the people. I mean, you know, you go in at halftime, the score's 30 to nothing. The coach has got to say something. You're not playing. The worst team in the NFL is only that much worse than the best team. Everywhere. You may find that out tomorrow. Houston might be Dallas. You never know. But, but I mean, we, we, we have so much work to do, and we get so caught up on the stuff that's not relevant to the work. We just we get so caught up on doing stuff that's not important. It is not important whether we have an organ or a piano or guitars or whether we sing a cappella like our Church of Christ friends do. It's not important. It's not important whether it's fun to come to church, although I hope it sometimes is a little bit of fun. We should have a good time. I wish I knew a better joke. The one I know that I think is funny, I can't tell. It's not dirty. I just it's disrespectful to somebody. <laughs> I can't tell. But it's really funny. Catch me offline, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah, I can't tell it. I want to tell it, but I can't tell it. I can't resist. <laughs> I'll tell it after I turn the TV off, and then I'll deny I ever said it. <laughs> but I think, you know, for me, I, I have so many friends at so many different levels of their faith. I have so many people that I know that, that think, I mean, the one I hear most often lately is that, you know, you people are righteous. And we're not. I, I don't know how to even describe that. That hurts me. Because if you know me very well, I'm not righteous. I don't want to be righteous. That's right. Sometimes I'm not reverent either. But that's not the point. The point is that, that there's people out there that think we're the righteous people. And if they believe that, we're not doing our job. We need to tell them. What, what happens, for those of you that have been to an AA meeting, what happens is somebody discloses in the AA meeting that I used to be where you're at, pal. What would be wrong with that kind of a Christian message when we try to get people involved with Christ is I used to not believe either, or I've doubted, or I don't always know whether it's right, and I certainly don't understand every word that's in this book. But I keep reading it. And I know that there's some stuff in there that will lead me closer to God and it'll lead me closer to Jesus Christ. And no matter what else, that's the only way that I'm going to have eternity. That's right. And so maybe I need to spend more time on that and less time on which version of the Bible you read mm. or, or, or whether you, you go to a church that does it one way or the other. Maybe I just need to care. And it's not about coming into the front and kneeling down and putting on some show about saying the sinner's prayer. God knows where your heart is. And your heart is what counts. And I believe, and Wesley would have agreed with this, that if your heart is changed, then your hands and feet are going to show it. How you live is going to show it. Just showing up, like the guy named Ray that was out in the pumpkin patch, just kneeling on your knees every Saturday night and praying, that's not going to do it. Because sometimes, when we shut up long enough, God speaks to us. And God leads us and directs us. And there's just times in my mind when I can hear God saying, you need to do it different. But unfortunately, God doesn't always give me all the answers about how to do it. 
You got to get out there and test the water and find out what's going on in the world and find out ways that you can help. And I got to tell you, I know I've said this a lot of times, hanging out with only people that go to your church and act the way you act and believe what you believe is not going to increase the size of the kingdom. If we're going to do our job, we've got to hang out with some people that we don't get infected by the world, but we got to be in the world because if not, they can't see us. And for years and years, maybe three or four generations, the church built walls around it, and you pretty much, they wanted everybody to look like they looked and smell like they smelled and wore the clothes they wore and believe what they believe. In today's world, and I know this is true, but when I was younger and in high school and so forth, I would have wondered about dating a girl or being become good friends with a person that was in a radically different faith. I, you know, I would have thought twice about that. I, I grew up a Protestant in a Catholic neighborhood. I'm not sure I would have dated one of those Catholic girls in those days. But you know, what I what I found out is that in today's world, more people are going to come because they have questions than are they think they have answers. More people are going to come because they don't know what they think. And some of the time, we spend so much time giving them short little platitude answers. My most disdainful one is, oh, just quote John 3.16 to them, you'll be fine. For God's all of the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Have you ever read 17? Because it says, He came in the world not to punish it, but to save it. And, and so if Jesus is coming to the world to save it, then it seems to me, that we Christians need to be helping Him by becoming His hands and feet. Now, some of the time, our own will is in the way. And we can pray about that, and we can, in community, we can confront each other, we can help each other, we can lead the way. But if you're going to make a difference in the kingdom, it's not going to be just for people you know. It's not going to be people just think like you think. It's going to be with outsiders. And when, when I've seen this church have the most increase of people coming especially on Saturday night, it was when we had people coming here that had no clue what church was about. They didn't know whether you stood when you sang or sat when you sang. It's the reason I don't do a lot of that stuff in this service. First year we were here in 2009, 35 adults made their first time profession of faith in this service. And these were people who didn't have church. And we didn't care. We baptized them. And we, we let them down the way. Now what happens is every church does it. We get complacent. Well, we got a lot of people now. We don't need to work so hard on it. Yeah, we need to work on it. We can't ever give up. We've got to keep going. Even no matter what. We've got to be patient. Let the crop grow. Bear fruit. And what we do, I believe the kingdom of God will be increasing. And I know the scripture says even when one, just one, returns to the fold. There's a celebration in heaven. So friends, I don't know about you, but i got work to do. How about you? Amen. And can we do it? Yes. We can work on it. Right? We will do all that in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, tonight as we come to the table, we'll... Uh, I think everybody here, and I know, knows it's, I don't need to tell you, everybody can come, but everybody can come. Uh, let's pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for the opportunity to celebrate at your table. Uh, this small representation of it is nothing like the one that you really sit at. It's a huge table. There's a place set for everyone. Tonight as we gather here and we're reminded of the work you've called us to do. The work that you've commanded us to do. We ask you to make this bread and this cup become for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we take this bread and dip it into that grape juice and we take it into our bodies, we are taking internalizing Jesus to become a part of the work He's doing in His kingdom now to bring about His kingdom on earth. So God, sometimes we fail. We ask Your forgiveness. Sometimes we have fear. We ask you for strength. And sometimes we just need a nudge to keep going. And we ask the Holy Spirit to give us that power. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite Chris to come first. And Mike. Chris and Mike.
your friends, the table is prepared. Come to this place. We have dinner. see you in church again. Let me remind you, Christmas Eve, we'll have a 5.30 service. We'll have an 11 p.m. service. And then guess what? Christmas morning, we'll have an 11 a.m. service. I'm hoping somebody will like wear pajamas or do something to make that exciting because I think it's not going to be very busy. But uh, we're going to have it. We'll be here. and We look forward to seeing all of you. Be safe. If you Don't forget next, not tomorrow, but next Sunday we'll be having Santa out in the courtyard if you want to bring your grandkids or friends. Or if you want to come, sit on this lap. Whatever it is. Friends, we've been to the place tonight where heaven and earth meet. We've been challenged, maybe, just a little bit by uh, James. And, and uh, hopefully we'll see a way to take Jesus into the world, the light of Christ, out into a world that's desperately hurting. In the name of Jesus Christ, friends, go in peace. Amen. Amen.